Welcome back. We are in Chapter 14, Part 4, and we're moving into macular degeneration. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but I also have a picture to show you where the anatomy of it is. And you may already be familiar with it from fundoscopic examinations, but once again, we'll review it in case it's a little fuzzy in your head. So the macula is an area on the retina, and it is where we have... concentration of cones and don't forget the cones are the color receptors and then as we move out from the macula we get a higher concentrations of rods which help us with peripheral and dim vision so when we have degeneration of the macula we lose that nice central clear color vision the macula can be damaged in many ways it could be damage due to <clears throat> damage to the blood vessels going to it or an accumulation of cellular waste in it. This happens as we get older, unfortunately. There tends to be a bit of a familial history. Lucky females are more prone to it. There's an affiliation with smoking because, once again, if you damage the blood supply going to the macula, you will damage the macula as well. We could get deposits of fat in the blood vessels going to it. And we actually could see, we'll um, talk about them, there'll be a little culmination of fat on the macula itself, damaging those nice sensitive cones, damaging our color vision. And, and obesity, once again, will increase the amount of fat going through our bloodstream, and more fat can be deposited in the blood vessels going to the macula, causing a decrease in blood supply going to that macula. Here's a picture of the anatomy. If we look at the back of the eye, so this is showing the retina. And if you're thinking about, you know, looking with a fundoscope through the eye, you look through the cornea, through the lens, through that vitreous humor to the back of the eye. So that's what we're looking at here. Not only do I want you to make note of the macula, which is that darkened area, small little round area, which is to the side of the optic nerve. We're going to go over the optic nerve structures as well. But the central portion is called the fovea. And then you can see it gets lighter as it moves out from that central fovea. And where that fovea is, and it's part of the macula, is where the cones are concentrated on the back of the eye. The optic nerve comes in, and this location is known as the optic disc upon fundoscopic examination. From the um, disc, or the optic disc, we have the optic blood vessels, both arteries and nerves coming out. That's a good anatomical structure to know as well. So this is a normal eye. We'll look at abnormal in our examples. Macular degeneration, there's two types. There's dry and wet. With dry, the blood vessels going to the macula become thin and brittle and or occluded. Don't forget the atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis is one of the issues that can cause macular degeneration. We can actually block the blood vessels going to the macula. This may lead to small yellow deposits that will form under or around the macula called drusden. Or Drusen, I'm sorry, not Drusen. So those depositions will increase in size and number, eventually leading to blur blurred vision or a dim spot in their central vision. Because don't forget, once again, that macula and the fovea have the highest concentration of cones, which give us our color centralized vision. Almost all people with macular degeneration are going to have this dry form. It can progress into a wet form, which is what we're going to talk about next. Wet is very rare, only it's about 10% of the people, but those brittle vessels break down and new abnormal fragile blood vessels will grow under the macula. And you could also have a leakage coming from those that will also put pressure on the macula and damage it. And we're going to show you visual representations of both of these in our Let's Practices.
So this progresses suddenly with rapid vision loss, so over weeks to months. And I would think that the um, blood leaking out from them probably comes from a ruptured blood vessel, which can progress that wet macular degeneration quickly. Now, otosclerosis, I've touched upon previously, and I actually think I mentioned it. The bones in the middle ear can actually get an excessive deposition of bone on and or between them, which will decrease their ability to bang against each other. If you think of those three bones in the middle ear, Mellis Inca stapes, they hit each other to transmit those sound waves. If they have bone growing around and or between them, you can't make them bum 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 bang into each other. Excuse me. And you cannot conduct that sound through the ear. Nerve loss can also occur, but nerve loss is not otosclerosis. I'm going to take that right out. Your book put that in there, but I think that's confusing two different things. Because this is a conductive loss, not a nerve loss. And we spoke about conductive versus nerve earlier. Okay, this can happen in young adults, women, and Caucasians. This can absolutely happen in elderly as well. Pregnancy can trigger this, believe it or not. Typically, this will affect both ears because that mechanism, that physiological mechanism, is going to be either something that may be congenic, con congenital, or due to, um, you know, listening to loud music. Um, I want to put in elderly. Okay. And over time, we tend to also deposit bone in areas where we may have like a problem. So maybe people that have some sort of problem with their middle ear can eventually deposit excessive bone as well can lead to tinnitus as well. Many ears. So this is a disorder of the endo lymph in that inner ear. Remember I mentioned that we have endo and perilymph that is in the inner ear that fills both um, the hearing part of the ear where we have the organ of cordy and also the semicircular canal and it will stretch both areas and the vestibule is simply the area between the cochlea and the semicircular canal it's just like the area that you walk in between them just like you'd walk into the vestibule of a house and then if you take a right you can go to the cochlea if you take a left you could go to the semicircular canals so you get an excessive amount of that fluid in there it'll stretch them and start to push on things and when it does that, it can cause a myriad of conditions and symptoms, which we'll talk about in the next slide. So the exact cause is unknown. They lift many things in there. Um, you know, once again, I would just ask you the generalities of Meniere's disease and not that laundry list of causes. So um, additional risk factors they put in there as well. I would think along the line of infections personally that may perpetuate this condition. But I do know that there's also idiopathic causes to Meniere's disease. And idiopathic means unknown. So they can have episodes that will remit. So they'll have periods that it'll flare up and then it'll go away. Can be triggered by changes in barometric pressure. So don't forget your barometric pressure is a pressure in the external environment. If your body can't regulate the internal pressure of the inner and also the middle ear would, you know, cause kind of a domino effect with this. It cannot regulate the pressure in that inner ear. Um, according to the barometric pressure or the external environment. So this can lead to that sense of vertigo. We're going to talk about vertigo versus dizziness in a few slides. Ringing in the ears, unilateral hearing loss, and sensation of fullness, fullness in the ears because of that increase in that fluid or the endolift in the ears. This can lead to permanent hearing loss because if you're increasing the endolift, you can increase damage to those little hair-like structures that sense our hearing. So let's practice a couple of these conditions for eye and ear. If we take a look at this, we're going to, and this gives it away, I understand that, but here's a healthy macula. 
Okay, it's just on the opposite side of what we looked at in the normal macula. But I want you to look at this picture here and tell me what those yellow structures are and what type of macular degeneration this would be. And then I want you to look at this macula compared to normal. This is a little difficult. And tell me which type of macular degeneration you think that is. So if you need to pause the tape, go ahead and do so. Otherwise, we'll take a look at this. This is dry. Those will be the drusen that we spoke about with the dry macular degeneration. As opposed to this more acute wet degeneration and the blood vessels underneath the macula are starting to expand and or leak blood out into that macular area which will put pressure on it and decrease its ability to function properly this one you've probably seen a million times if you need to pause the tape go ahead and do so otherwise we know these are cataracts Last but not least, we're practicing. I want you to take a minute and look at the anatomical structures and see if you could differentiate this. And obviously it's where it's pointing. That's an excessive, if you need to pause it, go ahead and do so, but an excessive depositing of bone tissue. This will be otosclerosis. I did put over here a normal error. And you can see how the stapes looks. And there's an excessive kind of cloudy deposition of um, bone here at the stapes. You can also get it between the bones, malleus and incus and stapes, which will decrease their ability to bang against each other and transmit sound waves into the middle ear. So we're going to talk about some other ones that probably look a little familiar. Strabismus, amblyopia, which is also known as lazy eye. Retinal detachment, which is a medical emergency. Nystagmus, which is that horizontal beating of the eyes. Tinnitus, which is that ringing or a sound that's in the ear. And vertigo, which is um, the sense of a room moving. So let's get right into these. And once again, if I'm going too quickly, please let me know. Strabismus is going to be a lateral or a medial deviation of the eye. It's usually due to a weak extraocular eye muscle. It can also be due to a tight extraocular eye muscle. So <clears throat> if you have a tight one, it'll pull the eye in one direction. The eyes don't coordinate together and it causes diplopia or double vision because they're not focusing on the same object. This could appear at birth or shortly after. And in children, you want to have this treated early. Um, children's brain patterns or pathways for eye inputs usually mature between 8, 9, 10 years of age. My son had this and I had him treated for it. We went for vision training. He's done very, very well. But my eye doctor said it's important to get it done before they're 8, 9, 10-ish because they can learn bad pathways and it tends to be more permanent. In children, the brain will actually start to ignore the eye that is turned in or out and it'll cause a weakness in that eye and then it'll never function properly. What will happen then is that weak eye gets weaker, the strong eye gets stronger, and the vision difference, their prescription is very different from eye to eye. So it's really important to get eyes treated when a child has strabismus. Okay, there can also be a neurological deficit with the innervation to those extraocular eye muscles. And remember, I taught you which are which. So for LR6, the rest are three. Now, your book has a picture. Okay, I think this little girl is just trying to cross her eyes. I'll be honest with you. So I put another picture, in, maybe I'm wrong, of different types of strabismus. I won't ask you esotropia, exotropia, hypertropia, hypotropia. If you end up going into a clinic that you're going to be working with a neurologist, I would study these. So I always learn these as medial and lateral strabismus. So the first one 
which you may still hear, which they denote as esotropia, which I won't use that word once again, but here you have it in case you need it. I learned as medial strabismus because the eye moves in. So what may be happening is you may have a tight muscle here or a weak muscle here, which can't pull the eye out into the appropriate position. Your extraocular eye muscles, which come from all the sides and from angles, also hold the eye in place as well as moving the eye in all directions. So if you have one that is weak and or short, it'll move the eye into the strabismus placement. So with lateral strabismus, this muscle may be tight. This one may be weak, also known as extropia. Hypertropia, same thing. This muscle may be tight. This muscle may be weak. Hypotropia, this muscle may be weak. This muscle may be tight. Now, amblyopia is when you get a lazy eye. This quite often will be affiliated with strabismus. If a, child, if a child has strabismus and their eye moves in, the brain starts to turn that eye off because it's not focusing prob, uh, properly. Okay, and they get what's called a lazy eye. They could also have a visual difference between one eye and the other. You may have a really strong prescription on one side and a weak one on the other. They'll turn that on and the eye will just drift in. So it could be one or the other. But either way, the brain will start to favor that one eye. And I'll start to try to accommodate for it. And it kind of turns it off, you know, and the eye will drift in. Oh, we just went over this. Brain stops growing between 5 and 10 years. So it's important to get this condition treated. You can go and get vision training. Um, some doctors, you know, ophthalm, ophthalmologists or optometrists don't believe in vision training. Just, you know, I don't know the research, but it worked for my son. And it fixed his um, lazy eye, which he had, gosh, started about two years ago. The only thing with the vision training, and I know I don't tell you treatments, but eh, I'm going to take a little time and tell you since it works so well for my son, is you do have to keep up with it. But it takes him two minutes a couple times a week, and it's worked very well. So anyway, you can get this from strabismus, which we spoke about. I think we have familial history because we have other members of our family that have it. Bilateral astigmatism. Now, astigmatism is when the cornea is abnormally shaped. It's very minor. A lot of people have astigmatism. Um, it's just a little bit of a flattened area on the cornea. Congenital cataracts could lead to it. So anything that may change your um, vision may lead to this lazy eye. Now, retinal detachment is when the retina will separate from that choroid. And don't forget, the choroid is the layer in the eye that provides a blood supply. This usually is spontaneous. It can be due to severe nearsightedness. With severe nearsightedness, I'd like to explain this anatomy to you. I'll try to do as best as I can. You know, I can't draw really well with this program. If this is a normal round eye, people who are severely myopic or nearsighted, I'm just going to over-exaggerate. Of course, it is not this extreme of a difference. But they have an elongated eye when people are nearsighted. And because it's elongated, you kind of stretch that retina that's on the back, and it's more prone to separate from the underlying blood supply. And when it separates, that vitreous humor will sneak right behind there and actually permanently separate it until they have <clears throat> the laser surgery. So, and this could be due to trauma too. This is a medical emergency. You want to immediately call a retinal surgeon and have your patient transported to their office. The sooner you have this fixed, the better the chances that they will have <clears throat> restoration of their eyesight. The longer you let this go, the more chance that they're going to have permanent visual loss. So we talked about that leakage of the vitreous humor behind the retina. There can also be tiny holes that will sneak the vitreous humor behind. This can happen with aging as well. 
Um, yeah, when we spoke about this. So the retina actually becomes ischemic. And don't forget the retina has all of the nerves that gives us our color, dim, and peripheral vision. So this is really bad news and something that you want to have fixed as soon as possible. So this is typically painless. People may have flashes of light, especially in the peripheral visual field, blurred vision, floaters, and the big one is darkening vision, like a curtain being drawn across the visual field. And the reason that happens is they're actually seeing their retina roll off their choroid. So any of these, especially if they're acute, um, they manifest quickly and they're brand new. You want to have your patient have their retina checked. So surgery, you know, and I left that. Usually I'm not leaving the treatments in, but you got to get this one treated. This is super important. And many of these conditions are super important, but just, you know, I'm trying to give you things to take with you, bread and butter stuff. So nystagmus occurs when the semicircular canals are being stimulated by a disease. And I think I may have included this. I'm not sure if this was included in your book, but I added it because this is something that is important. So the semicircular canals are being stimulated by a disease. We can also see this with excessive alcohol use. And the eyes will move in a horizontal plane rhythmically. We can also see this if there is damage in um, the inner ear. We can also see the, with this with drugs as well. So there are several tests that you can do. You can actually extend the patient, hang their head off, and you'll learn this in ortho neuro, hang their head off um, a table, and then you turn it quickly to the side. That makes me a little nervous because that's actually a high stroke position, but it's one test that you can do, and their eyes will start to beat to the side rhythmically in an abnormal presentation if they have an inner ear or they could have a brainstem issue. One test that I put in here that I could see your boards like loving is the caloric reflex test. And what you do is you irrigate warm or ice cold water into the ear canal. It's a nasty, nasty test. People who do not have an inner ear problem will have a normal response and the mnemonic is cows. The ice cold water will cause an opposite nystagmus from the ear that you put the cold water into. Warm will cause the same or ipsilateral. So contralateral would be the opposite side. Um, uh, ipsilateral is the same side. You know, I could just see the, your board loving this. And anyway, the mnemonic for this is cows. And they usually end up getting sick because it'll stimulate vomiting centers. It's a nasty test, especially when you can do other ones. You can actually quickly rotate their head to the side, and that'll stimulate that nystagmus response as well. So don't do the cow's test. Don't do the caloric reflex test. Just learn it for your board, okay? Like I said, I could see them using that on your boards. Tinnitus is an abnormal noise in the ear. Could be ringing, buzzing, humming, roaring, blowing, wind blowing kind of sound. May be associated with exposure to excessive nose, the otosclerosis, and or Meniere's disease, which we spoke about previously. Vertigo is an illusion of the room spinning. Okay, as opposed to dizziness being like your head is spinning and you're unsteady. I think they're pretty close and I think they could cross over. Okay, two things that you should know is peripheral can, uh, vertical can be peripheral or central. So peripheral is damage to the vestibule, which I mentioned in the inner ear. That's like the space you walk into. And if you take a right, you see the cochlea. And if you take a left, you see the semicircular canals. So there can be with peripheral vertigo damage to the, and it's called peripheral because it happens in your peripheral anatomy on the outside of the body towards the ears. So the vestibule, semicircular canals, or the vestibular nerve. So this could be medicines, uh, damage, Meniere's disease, nerve compression. Peripheral is different from central. Central is damage to the brainstem and or the cerebellum. Okay, could be in the brain as well, but it's most likely going to be in brainstem and or cerebellum. So in addition to anatomically be a different area that causes vertigo, it 
also may manifest with nausea and vomiting. So it's a location coupled with nausea and vomiting because you're stimulating those vomiting centers. Could you have nausea and vomiting with peripheral? Absolutely. But I'm just thinking once again, kind of, you know, differentiations between them. So central vertigo could be due to, um, you know, athro or arteriosclerosis, medications, MS, seizures, brain stand trauma, something that's going to damage the cerebellum as well. My friends, that brings us to our last question time ever. A patient with Meniere's disease may present with nausea and vomiting, vertigo, loss of hearing, two of the above. Answer that, please give me the answer and we're done. My friends, it has been my honor to teach you through these 14 chapters. As always and forever, I'm always here for questions if you need me anytime before, during, and or after the class that you have with me. Keep in touch, and if you ever have any questions, as always and forever, this is Dr. DeShavo. Shoot me an email. Take care.